It is such a treat to be here again. It's been a while, but I'm back, and I'm really excited to share with you something that the Lord has put on my heart. So why don't we do this? Would you start out this morning by just praying just a short prayer with me? Would you put your, your hands and your arms in a, in a receptive posture, and let's just invite the Lord. Because you don't need a word from me this morning. You need a word from God. And I love what Paul says. He says, this is the message that we preach, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truths with spiritual words. Lord, I pray that you would give me spirit words that would pierce hearts this morning. Lord, we just welcome the word of the Lord. I love that song we were singing, one word from you. One word from you can change everything. Jesus, I pray for a word for you, from you that will change lives, that will change trajectories, that will change the path we're walking on today. We receive it from you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we have been in a message series called Courageous Faith, and it has been really good. Um, Would you turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11? Many of you guys know this chapter has been called um, by by the body of Christ as the Hall of Faith. And um, up on the screen, we've got a picture of a Hall of Fame. Um, Some of you might know this is the Major League Baseball Hall of Fame. And the Hall of Faith is just a play on words. It's really the Hall of Fame for uh, for Christians, right? It's like we're, we're walking down this corridor and we've been observing the lives of men and women of God who are famous for their great faith, right? But it's easy for us in this room to just be bystanders, onlookers like these people, just observing the journeys of men and women of God and applauding their acts of faith, but just looking on from a distance. But at the end of Hebrews 11, it says something very intriguing. In verses 39 to 40, it says all of these people earned a good reputation because of their faith, yet none of them received all that God had promised. For God had something better in mind for us so that they would not reach perfection without us. In other words, the hall of faith is not complete without you in it. God has more in mind for you than for you to just be a spectator of someone else's great faith. He wants you to have courageous faith. There's a spot on that Hall of Fame wall reserved for you. It has an inscription on it. It says, by faith, Debbie, fill in the blank. By faith, Astrid, fill in the blank. By faith, Lynn, fill in the blank. You have a place. But how do we get there? I know you're asking that question. (laughs) How do we become people of courageous faith? like them. So today, we're going we're gonna to take a look at the life of Moses, and I actually want to show you two specific principles from his life that I believe will help you, will help me, will help us become people of courageous faith. Last Sunday, Pastor Garen introduced us to little baby Moses. We learned from Jeremiah 1.5 that God knew you before you were even formed in your mother's womb. Before you were born, he gave you a purpose and an assignment to do something great for him. Moses' parents knew right away that he was not an ordinary child. It was evident from the start that he was born with a divine purpose. That's why his life was spared. That's why the Pharaoh's daughter spared his life. He was delivered to be a deliverer. But he didn't start out with courageous faith. 
and it's the same way with us. You, you are born with a purpose in God, but you don't start out with courageous faith. What's the first thing that comes to mind when you think of Moses? There should be a photo. That is exactly what comes to my mind. <laughs> I found that verse on the internet. I said, I mean that picture, and I said, yep, yeah, that's it. Am I supposed to dance right here? I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, so in Hebrews 11, we are just going to read one verse out of this chapter, and it's verse 27. It was by faith that Moses left the land of Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He kept right on going because he kept his eyes on the one who was invisible. Now, this is the Moses that we heard about in Sunday school. I totally would have danced right there, but I'll spare you guys. This is the Moses we heard about, the, the man of great faith, right, who performed all the miraculous signs and wonders before Pharaoh and all of Egypt. He uh, parted the Red Sea and courageously led the people of Israel out of Egypt. But you may not know that Moses actually left Egypt twice. And the first time that he left Egypt, he was running in fear for his life. You don't see that in Hebrews 11. We're going to actually turn to Exodus chapter 2, and we're going to read about what happened to Moses. It says, Exodus 2, verses 11 to 15, Many years later, after little baby Moses, when Moses had grown up, he went out to visit his own people, the Hebrews. He saw how hard they were forced to work. During his visit, he saw an Egyptian beating one of his fellow Hebrews. After looking in all directions to make sure no one was watching, Moses killed the Egyptian and hid the body in the sand. Ooh, bad move. So the next day, um, I'm going to try to summarize this. Moses goes out to see him again. He sees his, his fellow Hebrews fighting. He kind of gets in, in, in the middle of the fight, tries to break it up and say, hey, what are you doing? And then they start giving him some kickback. And they say, who, who, are, who are you to tell us what to do? Who appointed you? Right? You can see the little head nod. Are you going to kill me like you killed that Egyptian? Uh-oh, Moses was afraid, thinking, now everyone knows what I did. And sure enough, Pharaoh heard what had happened, and he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in the land of Midian. He runs for his life. I probably would, too. <laughs> so, so here he is. He's an adult. The Bible tells us in Acts 7.23 which Acts 7 is just a parallel passage to the passage um, in Exodus 2. It's the Apostle Stephen. He is telling the life of Moses. And what he says in, in Acts 7.23 was that Moses was, 20, was 40 years old. So he is fully adult. By this time, he knows his purpose. That same passage tells us that he assumed that his fellow Israelites would realize that God was sending him to rescue them. But he tries in his own strength to deliver them, and it doesn't go so well. So he ends up fleeing for his life, and um, he's terrified. He is full of purpose, but he lacks the courage to face Pharaoh. So instead of fulfilling his call, he spends the next 40 years tending sheep in the wilderness. 40 years. That should be an encouragement for anyone here who's feeling like they missed their call. Moses was 80, okay? 80. <laughs> Have you ever been in the wilderness? And I'm not talking about a physical desert, but a spiritually dry place where you just feel empty and dry. There's nothing growing in your life, and you God feels miles away, and you just feel stagnant. I've been there. 
But something happened to Moses in his wilderness season. We're going to talk about that today. He went from fearful to faith-filled. Moses encountered God. So why don't you turn with me to Exodus 3. We're going to read this whole, uh, this whole story of what happened to Moses in the wilderness, um, starting at verse 1. One day Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. So while he was in the wilderness, he did get married and have some kids. So he, he, he wasn't just tending sheep, um, but he was, he was tending the sheep of his father-in-law. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. There, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't that bush burning up? I must go see it. Anybody else here in the room like to talk to themselves? This is Moses out in the wilderness having a conversation with himself. I'm going to go look at this. And when the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am, Moses replied. Don't come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals for your standing on holy ground. If you've heard those words in a song, now you know where it comes from. You are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. And I don't know if you guys know this, but, but Moses didn't grow up with the Hebrews. So I don't know where he learned about God, but he must have learned about God somewhere. Because all of the Jewish people knew that God said, you must not look on my face because those who look at my face won't live. So he knew not to look at the face of God. He hid his face in fear of the Lord. Then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. Then he says, now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people out of Egypt. I want you to notice how God said, I've come down to rescue them. Now go, I'm sending you. Sometimes we look at the things going on in our world and we wonder, why isn't God coming down to do anything? But I'm telling you today that God is looking for someone who will partner with him and go and be his hands, be his feet, be his heart to those around. He could come down, but he chooses to use us. So the first principle that we see in the life of Moses is that you gain faith through personally encountering God. To the natural eye, it looked like Moses failed in his purpose, that he even missed God, and that the wilderness was some kind of punishment from God. But God was using that wilderness to prepare him and position him for this divine encounter that would eventually launch him into his purpose. The Bible is a book, guys, of real stories of ordinary people who encountered God, and their radical encounters with God changed them. And not only them, but change the world through them because those encounters launch them into their purpose. If you believe that this Bible is true, then you must also believe that you can encounter him yourself. You were created to encounter God. 
That is why Jesus died on the cross. He opened the way so that you could come into the presence of God and encounter him for yourself. Jesus said this in John 14, 21, and I have it in the Amplified. I love Amplified version because it always adds more detail. The person who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who really loves me. And whoever really loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and reveal myself to him. I will make myself real to him. I will make myself real real. I don't know about you, but I want God to be real. I don't want just stories on a page. I want, I want the real encounter with God. But a divine encounters are not just for us. They're not just for you to feel good, to get goosebumps, right, to feel good, although that's part of encountering God because he comes, he comes to comfort. He comes to put his arms around us, and we feel good, But they're also, it's through encountering him that you gain the courage that you need to fulfill God's call on your life. So if you're in a wilderness, take heart today. God is not punishing you. He might just be promoting you. He might be using this wilderness time to prepare you to lead someone else out of their wilderness You know, Moses, he led the sheep around in this wilderness, this exact wilderness that ends up to be the exact location that he led the people of Israel through the wilderness. He had no idea when he encountered God that he would need to know that area. It was his training ground. And maybe where you're at right now is exactly where you need to be because God is training you and getting you ready. I want you to lean in. If you're in a wilderness season, lean into God because that wilderness is paving the way for your greatest encounter with God. Amen? And I I just want to point out three things in in Moses' encounter with God that were absolutely essential for him, for him to fulfill his calling, and they're just as necessary for us today if we're going to do something great for God. At first glance, when you see this burning bush in the desert, you probably think, what What does this have anything to do with God? Right? It might seem like a random, a random a happening out, out in the middle of nowhere. But could it be that God was revealing himself to Moses as fire and that this bush or tree was that was set on fire was Moses himself because the first thing that you need in order to fulfill your purpose in God is the fire of his presence so what Moses was not able to do before he encountered God in his own strength he could now do with the presence of God upon his life no amount of training or skill or education, can replace the need for the anointing of the Holy Spirit on your life. That's exactly why Jesus told the disciples in Acts 1-4, don't leave Jerusalem, don't go anywhere, but wait until the gift that my Father has promised. Wait, because as I told you, John baptized with water, but in a few days I will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So why did they need the fire of God, fire of his presence on their life? He tells them why in verse 8. You will receive power. You will receive enablement. You will receive the, the skills. You will receive the competence. You will receive all you need when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And we can see, looking back, how on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came upon the believers as a visible fire that rested on each one of them. They, too, became trees set on fire. 
His intention for Moses, his intention for the early church, and his intention for us has not changed. He wants you to be set on fire. He wants to pour out the fire of his presence upon you, and not just once, but continually, because the fire, he doesn't want the fire to go out. That's why Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 1, 6, this is why I remind you to fan into flame the gracious gift of God, that inner fire, that special endowment, that gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Paul was saying you receive the fire of his presence. Now it's up to you to keep it burning. The fire of his presence empowers you to accomplish your purpose. Years ago, I was sitting in a church service just, just like this one, and um, I, had, I had come rushing in that it was, an, it was an evening service. I sat in the pew, and just before I had come to church, I was getting my dinner ready, and the Lord told me, don't eat that. So I actually was like, I'm hungry, God. I really want to eat that. But he told me, don't eat that. So, so I said, okay. So I put, it, I put it in the trash, actually. I threw it away, and I, and I ran to church. And lo and behold, they're talking about fasting that night. And um, at the end of the service, they taught about fasting, why we should fast, how to fast. And um, he said, okay, now I want you to get together with the people on your aisle and pray for each other that you can fast as the Lord leads. And there only happened to be one other person on that aisle with me. And uh, so she, she begins to pray for me. And um, it was a nice prayer, and it was my turn. And I was young in the Lord. I hadn't really done much for him at this point. But I knew enough to, uh, to obey the voice of the Lord saying, don't, don't eat that. And, and so I start to pray for this, for this woman. And as I began to pray, a spiritual manifestation came upon me. This was an encounter that I had with God that is just as real now as it was back then. But I literally felt the fire of God falling down on me, and it was like liquid fire. And in that moment, I was trying to pray, but at the same time, I was encountering God. And so I was in this moment, and I was like, I was like, I can't even finish this prayer because it was so powerful. And as soon as I stopped praying, I opened my eyes. I looked at this woman, and I began to prophesy over her. I, I didn't do it, you guys. It was the fire of God on me that, that, that just suddenly pushed me, and I couldn't, I couldn't even stop it. And I begin to say, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. You will call upon me. You will come and pray to me, and you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart, says the Lord. And that woman and both of us were stood in amazement at each other, like, what just happened? I wanted to share that testimony with you because I want, I want you to know that I never prophesied before. But when the fire of God came on me, he enabled me to do what I could never do in my own strength. And I was amazed, just like Moses was amazed at that fire. The second thing that we see in this encounter is the fire of his holiness. I want you to notice something about this burning bush God tells Moses to take off his sandals because the ground around the bush is holy. Did you see that? God's presence on that tree, that bush, changed the ground. Whatever his fire touches becomes holy. Oftentimes we think, I can't come near to God because I'm not holy. But it's just the opposite. We must come close to God because only he can make us holy. It's the Holy Spirit that sanctifies us. Listen to what Paul said to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 6, 11. You were cleansed. You were made holy. You were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. His Spirit makes you holy. But also notice that God told him to remove his sandals. 
Now, sandals are dirty. They touch defiled things. We must remove defiled things from our lives if we're going to have the presence of God resting on us. Why? Because the fire of his holiness consumes and destroys everything that isn't holy. Moses also needed to know that the fire of God would not harm or destroy him. In just a few chapters later, in Exodus 19, God called Moses to the top of Mount Sinai while it was completely engulfed in the fire of God. And the Bible tells us in in Exodus 19 that all the people were trembling with fear, and even Moses himself was trembling with fear. And in that moment, my guess is he went back to that encounter with God and said, I remember that fire did not consume the tree. God's fire will not consume me. However, it will consume everything that isn't holy. So you better take off your sandals. You better remove those things, those unholy things from your life so you won't be destroyed along with them. He is an all-consuming fire. The fire of holiness teaches us reverence for God as Moses hid his face in reverence. It teaches us to fear God, not, not, a, uh, not a bad fear, but a holy fear that says, God is holy, so therefore I must be holy. Psalm 24, 3 through 5 says, Who may ascend? Who may climb the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Only those whose hands and hearts are pure, who do not worship idols and never tell lies. They will receive blessing and have a right relationship with God. And 2 Corinthians 6, 17, the Lord says, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord, touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. We all want to be received by God, but he says, first, touch nothing unclean, and then I will receive you. If you don't know what's unclean, go to his word. His word tells you, flee from sexual sin. His word tells you, don't worship idols. The passage uh, about um, coming out from them and be separate was, was in the context of idol worship. But to flee idolatry and anything touching idolatry. His word tells us that we're not supposed to copy the customs of the world around us. But we are supposed to be holy as he is holy. Go to his word. I love what Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 2. It's it's one of my favorite passages in the Bible. You hear me quote it at at prayer gathering all the time. 2 Timothy 2, 20 to 21. It says, In a wealthy home, some utensils are made of gold and silver, and some are made of wood and clay. The expensive utensils are used for special occasions, and the cheap ones are for everyday use. If you keep yourself pure, if you welcome the fire of holiness in your life, you will be a special utensil for honorable use. Your life will be clean and you will be ready for the master to use you for every good work. The fire of his holiness purifies you so you can be used by God. It was at an altar service um, just in the front, like this place right here, where I first encountered the fire of his holiness. It was a youth, it was a youth group, actually. And back in those days, it was common. Everyone comes to the front at the end and to seek the Lord. And it was in that moment that I had a revelation of the holiness of God. And I saw in a moment God's holiness, but also my unholiness. And I just couldn't stop weeping because I was like, I am so dirty. But I saw his his holiness come and remove all my uncleanness, all my impurity, all of my sin. And And he said, now will you go? I'm sending you. This was a powerful moment for me. We need the fire of his holiness. 
And the third thing that I see in, in Moses' encounter with God was the fire of his heart. See, Moses, or God began to tell Moses about his heart for his people, his compassion. And Moses needed to get God's heart of compassion. You know that he would lead the people of Israel for 40 years through the desert, and they would do some stupid things. They would complain against him. They would even say, I want to go back to Egypt. Moses needed the heart of God because Moses, you would see again and again that he um, prayed for them. He interceded for them, and he needed God's heart. You see, knowing God's about his heart is not enough. We need to experience it for ourselves. We need to get it inside of us until it compels us. The fire of his heart sifts out all the other motives. You know, we, we think about the Apostle Paul and the amazing things that he did for God. But before, before his encounter with God, he, was, he knew all the scriptures. He knew the word of God. But he was out killing people. And he thought he was do, doing it for God. He didn't have God's heart. But one day on the road to killing Christians... God encountered him. God shone like a bright light around him, and he fell off of his horse, and he encountered Jesus. And it changed him because first he encountered God's heart for himself. He wrote about it in Titus 3, verse 4, and I'm reading this to you in the, in the Passion Translation because Paul says, when the extraordinary compassion of God our Savior, and his overpowering love suddenly appeared in person. He's talking about his encounter with Jesus. When the love of God appeared in person, as the brightness of a dawning day, he came to save us, not because of any virtuous deed that we had done, but because of his extravagant mercy. You see, when we experience God's heart for us, it will naturally overflow to others. And that's exactly what happened to Paul. He went from murdering people to being motivated by love. It was Paul who wrote, it's Christ's love that compels us. The fire of God's heart compels you with his love. So we talked about how you gain faith through encountering God. The second principle that we see in the life of Moses is that you grow faith by obeying God. Even though Moses had a powerful encounter in the desert with God, he still wrestled with insecurity and self-doubt. He immediately starts um, listing off all of his excuses. I'm not worthy. What am I going to say? What if they don't listen to me? What if they don't believe me? He says, God, I'm not a good speaker. You can read about it. He, he lists all of these excuses. And the last one, the, the, the worst one, I don't even want to do it. Send someone else. Have you ever felt that way? I know I have. God, let somebody else more, more gifted, more anointed do it. Send someone else. But in the end, he still obeyed. He didn't let his objections stand in the way of his obedience. He gave God his yes. I love what Pastor Vlad Savchuk from Hungry Gen Church, he's one of my, my favorite um, pastors to listen to online. What he says is the secret to being used by God. When you don't have what it takes, just do whatever he says. We all know it's not your ability, but your availability. We have heard that cliche quote saying, God doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the called. He'll take a person who's not skilled or equipped, but who's simply willing, and he'll use them. Why? Because the harvest is great, but the laborers are few. And you see in this passage that every time Moses did what God told him to do, God did what he said he would do. Although not always right away. There was, in the beginning, God didn't seem to be doing anything, but Moses just went right back to God, and he was honest with him. And actually, I love Moses' prayer life because he's real with God. He doesn't, he doesn't pretend anything at all. He says, God, 
I did what you said and nothing happened. In fact, it got worse. Why did you send me? You're not even rescuing your people at all. This is refreshing to me because Moses just complained to God and God didn't chastise him for it. God just said, wait, I'm about to do something powerful. That's awesome. So sometimes we want to see the outcome before we obey. Or worse, we put conditions on our obedience. I'm only going to obey if I can be successful. Or if it's going to make me look good. True ministry is not about being a success in the eyes of people. It's about obeying God. You do your part, which is just to do whatever he tells you, and then he does his part. And that's when you see his faithfulness. That's when you witness his miracles. That's when he comes through and you, you have an, more encounters with God. You actually build a history with God. Moses built a history with God. It started at the burning bush, but it didn't stop there. He stepped out in faith, even if it was just a small amount of faith. And then he witnessed God doing his part. And his confidence grew. His courage grew. His faith grew. Have you ever wondered why Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 17, 20, If you have faith, even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there and it would move. Nothing would be impossible. Jesus said that because your faith is like a seed. You have to actually do something with it to make it grow. You have to plant it. You have to water it. You have to cultivate it in order for it to reach its full potential. Now, I have a little jar of mustard seeds that I bought years ago in my pantry and guess what? Those seeds are still the same size that they were when I bought them. <clears throat> if you want, hold on a second. If you want to have courageous faith, you have to actually do something with it to make it grow. Jesus also said that the mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds, but it grows to the largest of all the garden plants. So no matter how small your faith is right now, you can grow it, but you have to start by obeying God. You were born with a purpose in God. He is much more in mind for you than just to make it to heaven or to warm up a chair in church week after week, right? He didn't die on the cross. So that, so that you could just come to church, be a morally good person, be an onlooker at somebody else's faith. He died for you to remove the veil that separated you from the very presence of God so you could have a personal encounter with the living God and then gain the courageous faith that you need to go out and do something great for God, for his kingdom. For Moses, it was delivering God's people from the oppression of Pharaoh. It's not far from where we are today. All you have to do is go to a grocery store and you will see people all around you who are living under the oppression of Pharaoh. They're living uh, under a harsh slave driver, the devil. The story of Pharaoh is really just a symbolic story of the enemy of our souls who wants to hold us in bondage. There are people all around us in bondage. And I believe that God is saying, would you give me your yes today? The question is not, do you have what it takes? But are you willing to do what he says? Jesus heard their cry. He heard our cry, right? He came down and he came to rescue us. He, he laid down his life on a cross to deliver us. But then he says, now go, I'm sending you. Would you say yes to him today? Now, maybe you're listening to this message and you could honestly say that you've never personally encountered God. You come to church, but you've never encountered God in a way that's real 
Or maybe you have, and it's just been a long time, and you've let that fire go out. And today, you want a fresh encounter. So really quickly, I want to give you some very practical tools that you can use to position yourself to encounter God. And I'm going over time, so I'm going to go really fast. It's really up to God to encounter you. You can't force an encounter with God, but you can do things that will position you to welcome his visitation in your life. So the first thing is to get thirsty. Get thirsty. Get thirsty for God. Wilderness seasons usually precede great encounters with God because we get thirsty in the wilderness. It's hot and dry, and we become very aware of our need for God. So get thirsty. I'm going to skip a few things because I know I'm running out of time. Sometimes we don't thirst for God because we're letting so many other things satisfy our soul. But he did promise that he would satisfy those who hunger and thirst for him. The second thing is to get rid of distractions. If you've ever been out in a real wilderness, there's no cell phone towers out there. There's no uh, big screen TVs. It's just you and God. Sometimes you just need to get rid of distractions and get to a place where you can be quiet and still before God so you can actually tune in to him. Go to a place where God is known to show up. Moses went to the mountain of God. That was a place known to be where God visited. Over and over, God showed up on on Mount Sinai. And sometimes we just need to get to a prayer meeting. We just need to go to church. We just need to get to a conference. We need to go somewhere where God is known to be and we'll encounter him because he promised to show up wherever two or more are gathered together. The next thing is to get rid of any boxes that you put God in. I know sometimes we can put limits um, on how we think God should reveal himself. Just because it's not in the Bible doesn't mean that it isn't God. You know, before Moses had a burning bush experience, it was not written anywhere. There was nobody else having a burning bush experience. So he, if it had been us, some of us would have come to that burning bush and said, well, it's not in the Bible, so it can't be God. And we would have walked away and missed our encounter. So don't put God in a box. You know, the Jewish people uh, from G- of Jesus' day missed God's visitation because they put God in a box. They said the Messiah is going to come this way. And they didn't recognize him because they limited him. The next thing is to come closer. Moses came closer. I believe that the burning bush was out of Moses' way. He had to work to get to it. It says that the Lord noticed when Moses came close. And God notices when we make the effort to seek him. He notices when it's hard and we don't feel like going to the prayer meeting, but we go. He takes note. And then he, then he, he draws close to us. James 4, 8 says, come close to God and he will come close to you. He promises that when we draw near to him, he'll draw near to us. The next thing is to remove your sandals. And Moses, you know, he didn't know that he needed to remove his sandals. God told him. And if you don't know what you need to remove from your life, God will tell you to. You just ask him. King David said, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me. Know my anxious thoughts. See if there is anything in me that offends you. And lead me along the path of everlasting life. The last thing that you can do to position yourself to encounter God is to ask him for the fire. Ask him for the fire of his presence. Ask him for the fire of holiness. Ask him for the fire of his heart. Amen? Amen. Thank you guys for, for, for letting me share. I know I went a little over time, but I want to make sure to give you an opportunity to respond. And, be, and before we respond, if you're here and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to give you a chance to pray with me and to receive him. Because as I shared, it's because of what Jesus has done that we can come now into the presence of God and encounter him. Maybe you don't even know Jesus and you just need, you need to first come to him and give yourself to him. If that's you, would you just, would everyone just bow your heads with me? If you could say, I, I haven't made a decision to follow the Lord. 
And raise your hand, and I want to pray with you. I want to pray with you today. Amen. Amen. So we're all here. We all know the Lord. We all know Jesus. Some of us, it's been a while since we've encountered God. I want to give you an opportunity to, to respond to this message. I want to invite you um, to stand to your feet, if you will. If you have never encountered God or you want an, a fresh encounter with God, I, I want to make this place a place where you can encounter God. I encounter God so many times in church, at the altar, at the front, and I want to invite you to come forward today and, and to make this place a, an altar where you can encounter God. So come on forward. If you want a fresh encounter with God, come on forward. Come on, he says, draw near to me, and I'll draw near to you. Get thirsty. Get thirsty for God. God takes notice when we go out of our way to seek him. He takes notice just like with Moses. He says, okay, now, now Moses is coming closer. Now I'm going to speak to him. When we come closer, he says, okay, now I'm going to come close. Jesus, we just, we just cry out to you for a fresh encounter this morning. We cry out to you, Lord, just like the people of Israel. Lord, we, we want to encounter you. They, they had manna, and every day they would go out to get the manna. And then they weren't supposed to, they weren't supposed to keep the manna till the next day because it would, it would get maggots in it. And it's just like with us today that we, we, need, we need a fresh encounter with God because the old encounter, is, it's old, it's dead, it's gone. Amen. We need something fresh for today. And look, just make this place a place where you do that. You just call for the fire. Say, God, I need your fire. I want your fire in my life. I need the fire of your presence upon me. I need the fire of your holiness in my life. There's, I've seen some things in my life that, I, that I've been compromising a little. And I want you to come and burn away everything that's not holy because I need you desperately, Lord. And I need your heart for people. I need your heart, Lord, the fire of your heart to burn in me so I have your love for people. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Just continue to seek him. Give me Jesus, give me Jesus, you can have all this world, you can have all this world. 